The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today as we discuss the importance of including digital video as a component of your overall marketing strategy. We're so excited to be partnering with the American Marketing Association and have the opportunity to connect with you today. I'll begin with some introductions. First, I'll just do a quick introduction of our organization. We are from AdTaxi. We're a marketing agency that offers a full spectrum of services to promote businesses in the digital space. Um, we're known for our team of digital experts who specialize in solving complex marketing challenges with smart and effective solutions. I'm Sherry Cosgrove. I'm the product marketing manager here at AdTaxi, and I'll be the moderator for today's presentation. Our speakers are Lindsay O'Connor, our Senior Sales Director, and Murray Warnoff, our Director of Research. Thank you, Murray and Lindsay, both for your time today. So to get started, I'll talk a little bit about what we have on the agenda for the day. Um, our discussion is going to start out with an analysis of current trends and factors that are impacting video marketing efforts in our increasingly digital environment. We'll identify some tactics for incorporating digital video that have been proven effective in today's marketing place and examine how you can apply those tactics to your marketing plan. We'll move on to outline recommended strategies that will help maximize the return you get on your investment in digital video. And we'll wrap up today's presentation with some time for questions and answers. So we'll get things started by talking about some research and current trends in video marketing. And here I'll turn it over to our research specialist, Murray. Sherry, thank you so much. Uh, as we look ahead, um, we're trying to put as many things as possible into three buckets, but each one of these contains dozens, if not hundreds uh, of individual factors, individual trends as well, but big and broad. Right, the digital environment, right? What are we talking about? We're talking about the big shift in not just what we're using to watch programming, but also how and where, right? How and where we have access has is totally different today than it was just 10, 15 years ago. And you're going to see this. Uh, when we talk about changing consumer demands, we're talking uh, uh, about us as media consumers and I'm gonna say it's not so much a demand. I think it was born from choice, from preference. And now what we're seeing is engagement or from a marketing standpoint, what does that mean? Attention. And then lastly, the digital first approach, right? When we talk about time spent, when we talk about media reliance, it is digital first. Ed Taxi, as a matter of fact, did a survey just a few months ago regarding auto. And over half of all initial interactions with the dealership, a process to shop and buy a vehicle will not happen in person. They will happen digitally. Right. So moving ahead, let's talk a little bit more about those digital environments and devices. Right. We've seen a huge explosion regarding connected devices. Uh, the media consumption trends, which we're going to share, uh, are again night and day from just five, ten years ago. We're gonna talk about not just internet um, versus traditional, but we'll get down to TV and digital video, the comparison there. And then what's happening regarding key demos, 18 to 34, 25 to 54, we'll take a look. So starting with that increase in connected devices, uh, it, it is just unreal. 94% of all US adults have some sort of device. On average, we have 2.6 different types, laptops, smartphones. 94% of us have internet connection in our homes, and 85% of us today have something connected to that TV set, where if you look back just a few years, there were 11 connected devices in total in that household, and today, post-pandemic, 25 compared to 2.5 different TV sets within the same home. Totally different. So, so when we take a look at what does that mean regarding media consumption? Well, we can see three years ago, back in 2019, we were devoting more time to all things digital and traditional media, that being cable, newspaper, broadcast TV. And you'll see that that gap just continues to grow. 
Now that growth coming to digital is coming, yes, at the expense of traditional, but it's also coming from increased time spent as well. So on the next slide, when we move on, let's look specifically, not at traditional and digital, let's look at TV and digital video. And what you'll see is maybe giving a lot of growth to that time spent to overall digital is digital video catching up to TV. In minutes spent per day, neck, uh, getting closer and closer, uh, should be neck and neck within the next year or two with digital video overtaking TV. And when we go to the next slide, this is where really I started talking about key demos. Look at the 18 to 24 year olds here in the US using digital video, 97%. That's basically at plateau. 92% of those 25, 34. So when we talked about that 18 to 34 uh, year old demo that we uh, sought after branding demo, it is all digital video. But also look over the years, what's happened is the younger people move into the older cells, the 25 to 54 now is about 88%, nine in 10, all using digital video. And even the oldest of us, 65 and older, it's still half and growing. So as we move forward, let's talk about the changing consumer demands. And again, I said it was more about preferences. Let's talk about the uh, adoption uh, that we've seen in this channel. Uh, what we expect regarding TV advertising, TV meaning uh, the type of programming, not broadcast or cable. And then something very interesting when it comes to the response rates of how different people respond to different types of ads. So looking first on the next slide regarding that accelerated adoption, right? What we saw last year was 106 million homes having something connected to their TV sets with which they could watch programming. 108.2 million estimated this year. That's a fairly modest gain. Uh, and then another 2 million or so in 2023. Again, the US approaching plateau regarding connected TV, and getting it inside the home. We're, it just grew out of nowhere. And it's gonna, it's, we're getting close to peak. It's already so high. In the next slide, we could also talk about, <clears throat> excuse me, the penetration by age. And I mean, it's, it's 18 to 24 year olds at 90%. It's 90% of those 25, 34, very similar to what we saw regarding um, overall. Uh, but when it comes to connected TV, look at adults now 65 plus, now it's 72%. When it comes to things digital, especially connected TV, just exploding across the age groups. So what do we expect? We expect TV advertising, um, the volume to really continue what we've seen in past years. What do I mean by this? If you go back 10 years, there used to be uh, five commercial minutes in every half hour period or 10 minutes of commercial time every hour. Then the studies came out year after year saying, wait a minute, guys, when, when asked which media has the most annoying ads, uh, blowing everyone else out of the water was TV. As a matter of fact, this also translated into people saying it ruins my enjoyment of the media. And what's happened since? Well, there are now nine commercial minutes every half hour or 18 minutes of commercials every hour, almost one third of that hour. So again, we expect the shift to digital uh, video, to connected TV, just to continue and continue. And if we go to the next slide, what we're gonna look at is response rates. Look at the Gen Zs here in the US. These are people who were born as of 2000, they're, they're no older than 22. And more say they've responded to an ad on streaming TV than to TV, cable, satellite, all of those combined. Same thing with millennials who happen to be 23 to 37 this year. 41% respond to streaming TV ads beating out traditional TV. And even the Gen X, these are 38 to 57 year olds, look how close it is for streaming alone to beat the aggregate of TV and cable and satellite. So that really tells us something about that digital first approach. And on this next slide, 
um, that's where we get into this. What are we talking about? We're, we're going to see increased investment in connected TV. Um, we, we're going to share a quick spending projection and then talk quickly about, you know, summing this up in that outlook. So on the next slide, that increased investment, what are we talking about? Uh, just billions and billions have already been uh, shifted or have been added, and it's just going to continue. In 2022, 19.1 billion will be spent, not on digital video, but specifically just on connected TV. Almost 5 billion more than last year, and it's going to grow another 5 billion in next year. If you look at our next slide, this is where we get into the spending projections. How do we know this? Well, in a number of studies, and I'm providing the average here, only 4% mm -hmm. of all advertisers said, no, we're going to put less into connected TV. 51% said about the same. Almost half, 46% said more. That more versus less, right, is 10 times higher. We know the increases will continue. And so that's part of our future outlook based on what we can see, see consumers doing, like continuing to cut the cord, like younger adults in their first home deciding not to bring the cord in to begin with. This is gonna to continue to hamper cable. This is gonna to continue to benefit the streamers and the connected TVers. On the next slide, this is where we get into Lindsay's area of expertise. What does all this mean when going after our consumers in today's marketplace? So with that, Lindsay, I hand it over to you. Awesome, thank you so much, Murray. I'm very, very excited to kind of go through and take all of the awesome research Murray had presented and kind of help you apply it to what you can do from a digital marketing standpoint. One thing I do want to say before we get into it is that as digital marketers, we can overcomplicate things and overthink things very, very easily. So I want to make sure that we're really trying to simplify down what digital video is and how to best utilize it to accomplish your goals. So I'm going to review a couple of things. One, why choose digital video? I think Murray did a really great job kind of pointing that out, but I'll dive into just some other things to consider. Um, also, go through a digital marketing blueprint on how to exactly apply that into the strategies that you want to be utilizing, and then also the platforms to be considering. So why choose digital video? If we think about video from just the pure sense, it's a creative form. So instead of getting overwhelmed of like all the places you can put video, understand that it is a creative. And what's really great about digital video and why video is so successful is because it incorporates some of the most important um, senses. It elicits the sight, sounds, and motion. And when you pull all of those things together, it pulls out emotion from your viewer. And emotion is what really makes that impact and gives that lasting um, impression, if you will. So video, again, is just very unique in its ability to tell a story because of all of the, the little things that I just pointed out. So again, awesome, awesome creative form that can be utilized to your advantage with the power of digital. So if we think about why um, marketing ever since marketing became a thing, you know, when newspapers were out, then radio, then TV, it's really following the users, right? It's following the eyeballs. It's following the audiences to where they're spending a lot of their time. And what we know based on, again, what Murray pointed out, people are spending more time online and also with video content. So that's why that big shift in emphasis is being put on digital video because there's a ton of research to support where the audience is. And you can see here, 79% of people reported watching video online each week. That's a lot. That's almost 80% of the people online are watching video. 72% prefer to learn about a new product or service by watching a video. So again, we think about just you as a brand or a marketer trying to put yourself out there, people would like to learn about you from a video perspective. And then 217 million connected TV viewers in 2021 will have increased across all age groups. Again, Murray did a great job pointing that out, but we want to follow the audience where they are and digital video is the place to be. So another thing to think about when we talk about digital video is that you can display your content on the largest screen in the home, which is the television. So no longer is it just made for you know, broadcast and cable companies, 
streaming has become such an emphasis and such a big part that you can then tap into that and make sure that it's being displayed not only on a phone, but on that largest screen in the house. And then you can also extend that content to other devices. So if you take a look here, we talk about in marketing quite a bit about omni-channel approach, which is really, really important. And what that means is basically having your message being easily and seamlessly put across multiple platforms and multiple channels. So you're able to follow your user wherever they are. Um, and so not only having your video ad show on a connected television, but also ensuring that it's showing up on desktop, on a tablet, on a mobile device. So again, you're following that user and really reaching them and meeting your audience where they are. So if we think about an omni-channel campaign, sometimes that word has been thrown out quite a bit, so I want to make sure that it's understood. So one, it's using consistent creative. So making sure that the experience is being very seamless and consistent across all channels and all platforms but then also having a multi-channel delivery. So again, I pointed out connected TV is great. It is a wonderful thing, but you wanna make sure that you're also utilizing other devices and other platforms to make sure that you're getting um, and hitting people in multiple ways. And then finally, it has been proven time and time again to increase conversions. Because you're spending your time and reaching people across multiple channels and multiple platforms, you're giving yourself more opportunity to drive that person to a conversion. So a question that we have gotten um, quite a bit and even you know, from um, some people kind of reaching out ahead of time was about creative options. And what does that look like? So one thing to think about is you can have in-house production. You can have, um, you can use your phone. You can have somebody just, you know, within your organization kind of help you do some um, video clips along the way. You can use a studio production. There's definitely different options. Um, I know for us personally here at AdTaxi, we utilize um, montage videos quite a bit. So if our if our, our clients do not have video, but they do have some really great imagery, we can use that with some um, voiceover overlay, and that has worked tremendously well. Um, we also have other options where you can work with uh, vendors that can come in and do drone work, you know, come in and, you know, shoot right there on site. But again, it's not necessarily needed. You can see here only 15% of people say videos have to be professionally produced for them to make an impact. So that more authentic um, type of creative is really going a long way, especially when we think about the platforms that these videos are being served upon, right? No longer does it have to be this TV studio produced type of content. So some platforms to consider. There's lots of platforms available where your videos can be um, utilized, but there's two ways that we can access these platforms. One is the walled garden approach. So those are channels like YouTube or Facebook, Instagram, and Snapchat. Those can only be accessed through those channels. So if you wanna advertise on YouTube, you have to go to YouTube. If you want to advertise on Facebook or Instagram, you have to go to Meta. So understanding that is the walled garden. Then there's the other approach, which is the open internet. And so basically what that is, is all the websites, all the connected TV streaming options, all of the um, pre-roll, which is again, websites, that is open to many exchanges and it's called the open internet. So you can access multiple channels and multiple um, variety of content through exchanges. So what we have found is that combining those approaches is really, really key. Um, what we've, from our standpoint of running omni-channel video approaches, you can see that there are more users reached, the CPMs and CPVs are lower, and you can increase site activity. So all things tend to go up from a metric standpoint when you combine the social panel, uh, platforms, YouTube, and then the open internet capabilities and run them all together. I will also say that it provides a lot of data and insight as to what is performing better, what your audience is gravitating to. You might have the assumption that, yes, I wanna go after a younger audience, I need to be on Snapchat, so that's where they are, that's where I'm gonna be. But if you put all of your money there and you aren't testing out these other platforms, you could really have a miss as to 
what actually your audience wants. So it's great to have this more of a cast a wide net approach and let the data tell you what people want to see and where they want to see your ads. So let's look at some strategies for maximizing ROI. So now that we kind of understand, all right, there's the walled garden approach, there's different ways to go after these people. How do we actually you know, make the most to help make our campaigns effective? First and foremost, no matter what you're doing, is define your goals. Try to understand what is the end game here? What am I trying to accomplish with this ad or putting this ad out there? Um, again, using video everywhere, that quote unquote omni-channel approach, and then measuring and analyzing. And measuring and analyzing again is really gonna help you to succeed. So first, defining your goals. This is the most basic thing and seems so, so easy, but it's, again, I think we overthink and we overcomplicate things sometimes that we forget to just stay simple and focused. So some ways to define what your goal is, is one, identify who it is you wanna reach. What is it that, what is the message that you wanna tell this audience? And then finally, what do you want them to do? So if you're showing them an ad, right, this audience that you've identified, and you tell them some sort of messaging, what is the end goal? What do you want them to accomplish after that? And so once you have kind of that idea in mind, it is really gonna help you kind of pare down and take the next steps. One thing that I'm gonna get into also is understanding your goals can vary. You can have multiple goals. You might need to do some prospecting in addition to driving those end goal results, right? Like a sign up or, um, add to a cart or whatever that is, um, you can have multiple goals. But then again, you might want to look back at the number two here and the messaging might be a little different depending on where they are in your cycle. So identifying your audience. There's a couple of different ways that you can do this, um, or three I would say that's listed here. And the best that you have available to you right now is your first party data. So first party data is basically anything that you have on previous um, audiences that have interacted with you, previous customers, anybody who has provided you their email or any type of information, you can use that first party data to help you power your digital marketing campaigns to be more effective and efficient. So utilizing, again, if you have a CRM and you're lucky enough to like understand and pull that data, you can also pop that into any of your programmatic campaigns. You can also utilize pixel data. So if you're tracking audiences on your site, you can identify which ones maybe are a little bit hotter and down closer into your website's funnel to utilize that data to, um, again, find, find more audiences like them, which brings me to the lookalike audience modeling. That basically will say, hey, you know, I have these customers that are VIPs. They come to me quite a bit. I want to find more like them you can import those into any of the channels that I've discussed and find more like them, right? So similar people seem to do similar things. So it just makes sense that lookalike modeling would help you to find more people that are gonna be interested in your brand. And then finally, third-party targeting. So this allows us to tap into that data that's out there currently on the web, um, such as like behavioral targeting, contextual keyword, in-market audiences, demographic, geo, you know, location, wherever that is. So you can actually identify people who might fit within the audience segment you want to go after. So you can really, you know, pare that down by utilizing that third-party targeting. But the sweet sauce and what we really want to do is utilize all three of these and determine which ones are performing best. So you're not just focused on one and making assumptions with your first-party data or look like modeling, you're also kind of just getting in some maybe new people and new perspectives that you didn't have before. So message alignment is key as well. So understanding that what do you want to tell them part, um, what is the goal? And again, you might have multiple goals throughout your campaign, which is going to help you to determine how many creative forms do I actually need. So one, maybe you want an educational video to let people know who are you, what do you do, what is great about you, um, and that's that real like awareness piece. So that's going to help with prospecting. Um, it could also help just solidify people who might already be familiar with you, but just kind of solidify how great you are to that audience. Then as we move down the funnel, you can see engagement. There's the explainer or how-to video. So 
why work with us? Yes, you know who we are and why why we're wonderful, but why? Well, what's the reasoning? You know, what maybe more do we offer than you might not be familiar with? And why come to us versus a competitor? And then as they get down to the consideration phase, testimonials are huge here, or a case study. So anything that shows, you know what, people like you have worked with us, they love us, they're happy, that's a great way to kind of, again, nurture people down and get them over that hump. And then finally, when they're in the decision-making phase, they've already said, hey, I want to do this with you. A thank you video goes a long way or an upsell video. So you can, you know, cross-sell or upsell people who have engaged with you in the past, and this is a really great time to do it. So again, just having your message kind of align with where the person is in the funnel or where you're trying to speak to them. This type of content uh, will align nicely. So then if we look at the platforms that align with the same funnel concept. Um, so again, when we're up in that awareness standpoint, connected and addressable TV is huge. It's a wonderful way for you to get a message out to a large audience base. Um, another thing that's something to consider is that with connected TV, people can't click on an ad. So it also just allows for you to get that message out without having really hard metrics to apply to. Then when you get to the engagement side, that's where Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, YouTube, pre-roll video, those are really, really great at driving um, people further along down the funnel. And then when they're down in that consideration, that's where you can do sequential messaging. So retarget people across all the channels. Um, so once they've kind of engaged and they're into your site, maybe they've gotten to a piece of your website that shows their intent to convert, you want to retarget them with some really smart messaging. And then finally, when they're in that decision making phase, you want to make sure that you're driving that home again with strong remarketing and um, getting them to kind of convert across all channels. So utilizing all the different platforms that are out there. So when we think about using video, again, there's so many different, as I described up here, there are so many different platforms that can be utilized, but you wanna make sure that you're doing it appropriately based on where they are in the funnel. So when we think about frequency, so that was kind of mentioned there at the end, frequency is a very, very important piece. So you can see here by this research that two to five times, so if somebody sees an ad two to five times, they're 4.4% more likely to make a purchase than somebody who saw an ad one time. So, but if you look back here at one time, they're more likely to make a purchase than somebody who didn't see an ad at all. So this tells me two things. One, you need to hit people more than one time. You don't wanna overdo it. So you need to make sure that you have frequency caps in place, which you can put across most of the platforms I described, which says, I only wanna hit a user this many times within a week or within a 24-hour period or whatever it is. You can put those parameters out there. But the other thing to consider is that omni-channel approach. Let's hope they saw you one time, but the odds of them seeing you two to five times is greater if you have your ad across more channels. So then we also think about programmatic. So again, that's that open internet versus the walled garden. You have access to pretty much the entire open web. So I would say 95%, we use the trade desk quite often, and that is, we have access to 95% of the web that is out there and available. Um, so you can see here that one, you have brand safe, viewable, human contact um, that is available and right there. The, also the audience insights is huge. We understand right now Meta is having some issues, so it's harder to necessarily get some of the audience targeting that they once had available. Whereas with these exchanges, those third-party data providers are still out there and robust, and we're able to really drill down and get a little bit further than maybe you can in some of the other platforms. And there's also some really cool technology where you can build your own data with LiveRamp. So again, utilizing some of your First party data, you can build more and expand upon that utilizing live ramp. There's cross device targeting, which allows you to again follow users across multiple devices. 
And then again, as I pointed out about frequency and recency, you can put a ton of different um, bid factors in place around uh, those different um, capabilities. So from a measurement standpoint, uh, this is another question that we get quite a bit, is how do you measure success? Again, you wanna think about where the person is in the funnel and what that goal is. So if you're trying to do awareness, if you want people to just understand your brand, then impressions and frequency, that's gonna be the thing that is going to be most important. That how many times are you getting out there in front of the qualified audience that you're looking for? If you're trying to do um, engagement or consideration, that's where video views are going to be huge. You want to make sure that somebody's actually seeing um, and digesting the information that you're putting out there. Maybe there's a completion rate or rewatch rate that you can look for. Um, also look at the website visits and micro conversions. So what that is, is who is coming to your site and are you getting more traffic further down your funnel on your website? You know, is it they're coming to your home page and bouncing, or are they actually getting down to that, you know, checkout page or sign up for something? You want to see, are you driving the right behaviors on your website? And also looking at um, the intent lift. So are you getting more people to, again, make those important actions once they get to your site? And then finally, when we're down to that decision phase, that's where attribution comes into place. So you can really see, okay, are people making those conversions online? There's the ability to actually look at offline conversions as well. Um, and there's also like in-app. So have you seen conversions take place and increase there? We also have the ability to do advanced conversion reporting, which can actually show the complete user's path to where they started from and that first ad impression to the time they made a conversion. And that gives us a lot of insight as to what is performing, what's not, and where we need to shift dollars and focus. So finally, I, we are going to open it up for questions. I know Sherry has um, some from people who had typed in earlier. So I'm gonna turn it over to Sherry to bring up the questions that we have. All right, thank you, Lindsay. And thanks, Marie, for all of your uh insights and uh, information there that was great um, starting out with the question and answers here we were able to get some questions from our um, participants ahead of time and i'll start out with just the first one um, karen had asked would you like to incorporate we would like to incorporate more video into our marketing strategy in 2022 we're really starting from scratch we're looking for information about the best format content length platforms etc so um, I am going to go ahead and answer that because as a product marketing manager, I've been involved in some of these kinds of campaigns and development for video. And what's really great is that because the expectation, as it was kind of talked about earlier, the expectation for video production has really changed where people are not looking for really shiny, perfect studio produced video. Um, it's okay to just start small. Um, most of the social platforms if you're you know looking to put something out there on snapchat or or an instagram or even like in facebook or social platforms three to six seconds is even enough as long as you have that motion and that engagement that video brings um that is a great way to get started um most of the time when you're doing an ad type of video you're looking at something as short as 15 seconds um and so it really doesn't take a whole lot of um either money or time investment to make something really simple. You can go as you can, you can do it right on, a, on an iPhone. The quality of the video is just so good now that you can get that. Or like Lindsay had mentioned earlier, um, you can also do just still images and, and stitch those together into a video with a voiceover or do something simple like animation. So it's really, it seems um, at first glance, like it might be hard to get into, but it really is, is pretty accessible to just about everybody now. Um, and so I think I'll move on then to the next question. Um, the first, the next one we have here is, what is an expected conversion rate from a video? So I'll turn it over here. Maybe Lindsay, would you be willing to take that one? Yeah, absolutely. And actually it's 
important to just kind of think about where we ended. So, you know, think about that funnel. So there's the branding side, so that awareness, that top of the funnel, and then all the way down at the bottom. It's really hard to put one specific um, measurement in place, right? There's not like a one size fits all, if you will. It really depends on your goals and where that buyer is in their journey as to where you can measure success and how to measure success. Um, so again, another way to really think about it is um, back here on this you know, measurement insights. It's really aligning where the messaging is to the prospect and what types of goals that you're hoping for them to achieve, and you can measure it from there. So again, I think impressions and frequency is up there at the top of the funnel, and then obviously actual um, online and offline um, conversions is where you can measure them down closer to the bottom of the funnel and retargeting has a huge huge hand in doing that. Great thanks Lindsay I agree that analytics are so important because really you know you, you've set your goals and then you use those analytics to measure progress and they're and they're often different depending on your campaign and intent. Um, all right the next question I have here is where is the most effective CTA placed? Uh, in the beginning, the middle, end of a video, or in the description text, et cetera? Yeah, I, so from what I've seen, and um, I think in the beginning is very, very helpful because you want to make sure that you're getting that call to action and message out there in the very, very first part, as well as your branding. So if you can incorporate both, that's extremely important. Um, also in the description text, because that's a lot of times where uh, most people are going to see and be able to actually understand what it is that you want them to do. So I would include it there, but definitely put it in that beginning spot. Um, because if people don't necessarily listen to the entire length of your video, they'll at least catch the first few seconds, which if you put that branding and the call to action right there in the beginning, they're more likely to see it than not. I would definitely agree with that. And like you said, too, I mean, if you can get it into the description text, too, um, that that helps even to drive more clicks. If it's possible that they see it in one or more places, um, you have a better chance there. All right. I think this will be the last question. Then I've got one more here for you. It says um, with CTV, what types of channels or shows will my ads appear on? That's so that's a good question and one we get quite often. So with connected TV, it is different than buying traditional television. So when you would normally buy traditional television, you would use Nielsen data to assume, okay, this is the type of audience and demographic that it's gonna be watching this show or this content or this channel at this time. Um, what's beautiful about digital and specifically connected TV is that we're not necessarily worried about the content. Yes, we want it to be brand safe and up to par, right? But what we really want to focus on is the audience and that user. Who is it that you want to go after? And don't worry about necessarily what they're watching or when they're watching. It's just going after that person and reaching them whenever and wherever they are. So yes, we have access to you know some of the top channels and some of the top you know popular shows that are streaming. But that is not the point. You really want to make sure that you're focused specifically on audience and going after that user. All right. Well, thanks again, Lindsay, awesome. for all of your uh, feedback there with the questions. Um, that's it for questions for us right now. So I think we'll go ahead and just wrap it up here today. So I just want to say that we really are always available to answer questions that you have. Um, if you want to learn more about what we do, um, reach out in any way. Here's some connect, uh, some ways you can connect with us here on the screen. Um, call, email, um, hop onto the website, um, shoot us a note, and we will love to talk about um, options and, and just share whatever insights we can to help you make your marketing more effective. Um, and so I thank you all for joining us today. Really appreciate taking the time out of your day to uh, talk a little bit about how important it is to include digital video in your marketing strategy. Thank you.